From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We're going to begin today with foreign relations and with the Democratic Convention concluding tonight how a Biden foreign policy would differ from a Trump foreign policy. For some answers, welcome now Ian Bremmer, Eurasia Group president and G Zero Media president as well. Welcome, Ian. Always great to have you with us. Okay. Today, as we speak, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, has gone to the United Nations asking for so called snap back sanctions against Iran. Let's start with Iran. How would President Biden, we think, if there were a President Biden, differ from President Trump in his approach to Iran? Oh, it's pretty clear uh, that uh, the Biden administration, if it came to being, uh, would immediately try to restart uh, the JCPOA, the old Iranian nuclear deal. I, I don't think it would happen quickly, um, in part because that deal didn't get the Iranians, after their assets were unfrozen, the kind of foreign investment they had hoped for, and uh, because the Supreme Leader wouldn't want to give the Iranian president an immediate win, especially in the run-up to Iranian elections. But the relationship would improve, um, and, uh, and I do think you would get easy multilateral engagement between a Biden administration and the U.S. allies that helped to put that initial Iranian deal in place. And you know, David, that just a few days ago, uh, when the Trump administration brought um, a furthering of an arms embargo against Iran to a vote at the Security Council, it didn't even require a veto. It was 11 to 2 against the United States, uh, uh, quite an embarrassment. Uh, for the Trump administration. Yeah, at the same time, it, wouldn't it be awfully difficult to get that genie back in the bottle? I mean, years have passed. There was a clock ticking throughout in the length of the, the curtailment of their development. And in the meantime, they've been really enriching Iranian in Iran. Can we really just go back to status quo ante? You know, I, I'm just someone who believed that the deal was a good deal for what it's worth, David, but it was a limited deal. It didn't stop the Iranians from supporting Hezbollah and other organizations we consider as Americans terrorist organizations in the region. It didn't stop them from developing uh, ballistic missile uh, technologies and testing those missiles, which was in breach of United Nations Security Council uh, resolutions. And it didn't open trade or diplomacy uh, between the United States and Iran. So, I mean, it was a, it was a deal. But it was a limited deal. And so if you ask me, could we get that back, I want to I wanna make sure everyone understands that that doesn't suddenly mean that the United States and Iran are going to be friends in any way, shape, or form. America's closest allies in the region will still be countries like the United States, the UAE, and the Gulf states, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. And by the way, those countries are a lot closer today diplomatically to each other than they were under the Obama administration, in part because they all see Iran as their common principal enemy. And, and, and again, even though Biden would want to come back to the old deal, Biden would also see Iran as our principal antagonist in the region as well. So let's go to a different hotspot that'll be in the inbox for the next president, whether that's Donald Trump for a second term or a Joe Biden, and that it's Belarus and our relationship with Russia. Uh, it seems to me, at least, that President Putin has uh, got a bit of a problem there. Uh, he does. And, you know, what's interesting about Belarus is that the people of the country are not particularly anti-Russian. There was a, the most recent poll that was taken on this nationwide was back in December. But over 90 percent of Belarusians at the time had a generally favorable orientation towards Russia. You wouldn't find that in Ukraine, and you wouldn't have uh, before the Orange Revolution. So, I mean, there's enormous outcry against Lukashenko. They want him out. And if the Russians intervene, uh, they're going to be mad at Russia, too. And we're already seeing the Russians start to intervene. For example, Belarus and state television, which was off the air uh, because the existing anchors refused to cover um, a, a propagandistic support of Lukashenko. They wanted to cover the demonstrators. Well, now Belarus state television is covering the regime, and apparently Russians have come in, provided by the Russian government to allow that. So they are engaged on the ground. They're not engaged militarily. And, and there aren't great outcomes for Putin here. He'd rather this just continue to be 
a comfortable dictatorship aligned very strongly with Russia. But what's interesting, you're asking me about Biden. Uh, the, the fact is that the Putin administration understands that as long as Trump is in place, there's not going to be significant U.S. outcry against Russian intervention in Crimea or southeast Ukraine. I mean, Trump has on many occasions say, why can't we just forget about Crimea? They already took it. It's not my problem. I mean, I have a hard time seeing Trump standing up for democracy in Belarus, Trump standing up against the Kremlin. You've also seen that Navalny, uh, the most important opposition member in Russia, today is in a coma because he was poisoned, one would presume, by the Russian government. And, uh, you know, not something, something we see a, a lot, unfortunately, from Russia, but the timing here is unfortunate and certainly coincidental. You have to wonder, um, are the Kremlin, is the Kremlin trying to create facts on the ground while they know Trump is still there? because life would get more difficult for the Russians in a Biden administration. So, Ian, that's Iran, that's Russia. Let's get to the really big one, I think, on the agenda for whoever's in the White House in the next four years, and that is China, U.S.-China relations. You think, actually, this is something of a success, as I understand it, President Trump's foreign policy relationship with China. Yeah, in, in the sense uh, that pretty much everyone, Democrat and Republican, agree that the United States needs to take a tougher policy, a tougher stance against China. Uh, they were involved in a serious cover-up of uh, the coronavirus for the first weeks when they didn't tell their own people, never mind the World Health Organization or the rest of the world. That made this pandemic a lot worse. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese from Wuhan leaving the country during that period of time. Biden's mad about that. Trump's mad about that. Um, they are trying to become a tech superpower um, to have a lot more access and control over data of people outside China and competing with American tech companies. Both Trump and Biden would want to fight back against that. Uh, the Chinese have unilaterally changed uh, the rule set. There's no more one state, two systems with Hong Kong. The entire Western world opposes China doing that. That would be true for both Trump and for Biden. So, I mean, really, uh, you know, what you see, I think, in the next few months will be both the president and the former vice president competing to show that each uh, are tougher um, against, against this Chinese government. And I, I don't think, I think that if Biden came in, you'd certainly see a stronger effort to make U.S. policy more assertively multilateral use our allies and make statements together where, you know, Trump's orientation is more unilateral and forcing allies to get on board with the Americans as opposed to constructing policy together. But I think the, the broad sweeping strokes of those policies towards China actually wouldn't change very much between these two leaders. So not a potentially big difference, at least on the substance of the position. And we've heard Republicans this week say you don't hear about China at the Democratic Convention, in part because they really don't disagree with us on it at all. At the same point, is this sort of fundamental as a different approach, particularly in the tech world, particularly to the Internet, uh, where there's this term now, I've read, net nationalism. Uh, the Internet was thought to be open to all, a way of communicating with all. Some countries, led apparently by China, want to use it as an instrument of state power. That's very clear. And, uh, you know, we used to talk about a World Wide Web. I mean, that sounds quaint today. There is no such thing. Uh, the Chinese have a, a separate Internet and increasingly a separate Internet of Things that works for their own people and also that they are starting to export uh, to countries like Zimbabwe, for example, Pakistan, mostly poorer countries that have benefited from Chinese investment and loans. Uh, but the, the advanced industrial democracies are almost all aligned with the American tech firms. And so we can talk about net nationalism, David, but the reality is there are only two countries in the world that have global technology firms truly of scale, and that's the United States and China. And so I think it's more accurate to talk about a technology cold war, which we are presently in. The Chinese do not allow... American tech firms like Facebook or like Google or like Amazon to function 
um, openly in the Chinese market, the largest data market in the world. And the United States has now making it clear that Huawei and very soon uh, TikTok and WeChat will not be operating in the United States. And by the way, we don't want them operating with our allies either. And if they do operate with our allies, uh, we, we intend to make that costly, uh, both right. in terms of intelligence sharing and perhaps economic sanctions as well to those countries. Once again, I think that policy would be almost completely in substance upheld if we were to see a Biden administration come into place next year. So in here, in closing, when you talk about a tech cold war, uh, ultimately, I think it's fair to say the West and the United States won that te that original cold war against the Soviet Union, in, in large part because we had more resources. Can we win a tech cold war, given the fact that China is growing so fast and is going to eclipse us at some point here as a worldwide economy? You know, David, we had more resources, but also our ideas were better. I mean, ultimately, the Soviet Union and the East Bloc imploded from within because their ideology was bankrupt and because we were seen as leading by example. Now, I think if it's purely a tech cold war between the U.S. and China, I'm not sure whose technology is ultimately going to end up being more effective. Uh, I know a lot of the top experts in this field, and they're not sure. If it's mostly about scientists, it's probably the American. And if it's mostly about data, it's probably the Chinese. And there's a big debate going on in that front. Where we are winning is on ideas. Um, our allies, even though they don't like Trump, uh, do understand that rule of law and a comparatively free market in the United States is a lot better to align yourself with than a state capitalist and authoritarian China. And, and even though the United States right now is doing our damnedest to shoot ourselves in the foot on those fronts, and we're not feeling like we're leading by example very much. I mean, it's pretty obvious. If you're Australia, if you're Japan, if you're Canada, if you're right. France, if you're Germany, if you're the UK, right. and you're forced to choose between the United States and China, right. you'd say, well, no, I, I don't want to have to. I don't. But if right. you're forced to choose, yeah. you know who you're choosing. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. It's always such a treat, Ian, to talk with you. That's Ian Bremmer of the Eurasia Group. And a programming note now, we're going to have coverage of the last night, the fourth night of the Democratic Convention, starting tonight at 10, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, as Joe Biden accepts his party's nomination for president. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. As you and our guest Ian Bremmer were just discussing, in Russia, opposition leader Alexander Navalny has been hospitalized with suspected poisoning. The TASS news agency reports that the anti-Putin politician is in grave condition. AIDS believes something was put in Navalny's tea while he was meeting with activists in Siberia. China says trade talks with the United States will take place soon. The two sides had been expected to talk last weekend about progress on the phase one trade agreement. President Trump says he called off those discussions, saying, I don't want to talk with China right now. The president will call on the United Nations Security Council to restore all nuclear-related sanctions on Iran. It's an attempt to kill off the landmark 2015 nuclear agreement and force Iran back to the negotiating table. Key American allies have said they won't go along with any plan to reimpose sanctions. Former House Speaker Paul Ryan is trying a new business venture. Dow Jones reports Ryan is starting a blank check acquisition company. Bloomberg has learned he'll serve as chairman of Executive Network Partnering Corporation, which will seek to raise roughly $300 million in an initial public offering. The Wisconsin Republican chose not to run for re-election and was succeeded as speaker by Nancy Pelosi in 2019. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. 
President Trump's former campaign manager, Steve Bannon, was arrested today in New York, charged with fraud in connection with an online organization raising over $25 million to help build a U.S.-Mexico border wall. To go over what we know at this point, we welcome now Bloomberg legal reporter Greg Farrell. So, Greg, give us a sense of what this is about. I didn't know anything about it personally. Right, and uh, I was surprised by it as well. Um, basically, prosecutors in Manhattan uh, have charged Bannon and three others with misusing funds that were raised, over about $25 million in funds raised for the purpose of you know, privately building the wall that the president has talked about for the past three, four years. And, um, and uh, what they did was they raised the funds on the premise that all of it, 100 percent of the money that people contributed would go towards building the wall. None of it would go towards the salary or expenses of the people behind it, particularly a gentleman named Brian Colfage, um, who was the figurehead or at least the, the prominent face of the matter. But he was backed up by Steve Bannon. So anyway, uh, through crowdfunding, they raise all this money. Then they realize it'll be a little easier to move as much of it as possible to a different charity uh, with the same promise that all of it, 100 percent, will go to the, uh, the wall building. But there, according to the indictment, um, all four of them engaged in basically uh, like a shell game where some of the funds were shifted to shell companies or paid to Colfage's wife for consulting services or social media uh, et cetera. And as a result, Colfage took in, you know, the better part of a million dollars in uh, to pay for what appears to be a luxurious lifestyle. And Bannon himself, who I think was actually quite a wealthy man from his career in Wall Street, he too, you know, used some of this money for travel expenses and stuff that was just totally unrelated to the wall. Well, but when you say uh, travel expenses, it sounds like T&E, you know, a few hundred dollars here, a few hundred there. Do we have any idea how much money Steve Bannon may have taken out of this? Well, it, it, more than a few hundred dollars. It looks like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and because a, a guy like that travels a lot, he's in demand all over the world, um, and he travels well. So um, it's, it's, not a, it's not like you or me with our, you know, uh, monthly expense account that we have to file, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't have tens of thousands of dollars. That's for, that's for darn sure. Do you have any sense of the timing for this when it might go to trial? Um, if it does, it would be months down the road. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, you know, these guys have to make an appearance. I presume they'll enter pleas of not guilty and then make a determination as to whether or not it's worth fighting. And then hanging over this all, uh, you know, I don't want to just insert this out of the blue, but the fact that President Trump has been, uh, you know, paid attention to friends, former friends, uh, who've gotten in illegal trouble, uh, sometimes offering to help or at least dangling that possibility. I'm not sure if that would extend here. There's a period of time when Bannon was on the outs, you know, after he uh, left the Trump uh, White House a couple of years ago. But who knows? So yeah. that that's a subject that will come up as well, as whether or not, you know, the president will think of, because all of these guys yeah. are trying to do something nominally right. that was uh, in favor of the wall, but they were defrauding Trump's supporters. Well, well, Greg, while we got you, let's talk about President Trump, because I understand there's yet another chapter in the fight of the subpoena here in Manhattan. Yes, yes, t different, but it uh, turned out to be a big morning. So a federal district judge in Manhattan uh, 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 basically dismissed a complaint by Trump's lawyers uh, who are taking a second bite at the apple that uh, the district attorney of Manhattan, Cyrus Vance Jr., should not be allowed to uh, access or get hold of eight years of Trump uh, uh, tax records. And uh, this is th basically Trump lost today. But I think if you look in the past year, he has won just by litigating this process. Exactly. A year ago, the Manhattan district attorney Vance tried to get hold of President Trump's tax records and his, the Trump Organization's tax records going back to 2011. Yeah. And the president fought that. He argued uh, he wanted to move to federal court. He argued that a president is essentially above the law while he's president. Yeah. And that was smacked down by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And eventually yeah. the Supreme Court decided just last month by 7 to 2 vote yeah. you know, in favor of Vance. However, yeah. the Supreme Court allowed this to go back. Trump tried to a second right. time by making the same arguments that he right. made last year. Right. So he has won the race in terms of running right. out the clock probably for, you know, yep. the next two months. Because yeah. even if Vance got the tax records in two right. weeks or three weeks, right. uh, there's no way they'll become public until there's any kind of yeah. public action, if any, out of this. So don't hold your breath. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Greg Farrell. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Another stumble on the long road to recovery. U.S. jobless claims numbers came in unexpectedly high today. Over a million jobs with New York, New Jersey, and Texas posting the largest gains. We bring in now Bloomberg's international economics and policy correspondent, Michael McKee. So, Mike, as I've looked at some of the commentators, it's not clear we know why. Well, the general feeling is that at this point we're stalling out a little bit on the recovery because of the rise in COVID cases during the month of July into August. I was thinking while you were talking to Greg that uh, this is a bad day for Donald Trump. He's getting a lot of bad news because this isn't the kind of uh, economic data that you want to run on. The jobless claims numbers after 21 weeks over a million fell last week to in the 900,000 range, uh, was revised up to 971,000. And economists thought they would go even lower this week. But nope, we're up to 1.1 1 .1, uh, million during the last week. And that's bad news in particular because it was the survey week for August unemployment. So at the beginning of September, we're going to get a number uh, for, the, jo for uh, the jobs report that may not be particularly good. Overall, you still see 28 million people on the overall unemployment rolls getting some sort of aid. And, of course, that aid has now dropped back to... Uh, the, the amount you get from your state, that $600 is gone. So that's particularly bad news as well if you're trying to convince voters that things are getting better. One other thing I'll mention, David, on that list of states that uh, had the biggest increases also was Iowa, which is a <laughs> battleground state, and Donald Trump was just there. So yeah, he just visited bad there. It's all around <laughs> yeah. uh, politically for him. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting convention, Republican convention next week. Uh, you mentioned the PPP program, that payroll protection program. Uh, did, might this put a little more emphasis on the need to come break through and get some fiscal stimulus here? We've been talking about that fiscal cliff. Is it possible we're starting to see the edge of that cliff? Well, we certainly are. I mean, I it's for most economists, we've jumped over the cliff and we're just starting to watch the descent. The problem here is that neither side really seems to want to do anything. And the uh, folks at the Peterson Institute out with a study this morning that says this could cost uh, taxpayers $500 billion in terms of uh, lost income. And that could take four to five percentage points off of GDP. Okay, thank you so much, Mike McKee. Really appreciate you being with us on that jobless claims. We have a little bit of breaking news right now. Lyft, the company, is suspending rideshare operations in California at midnight tonight. This after the state passed a law classifying drivers as employees rather than contractors. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we turn now to Mark Crumpton. David, a federal judge has rejected President Trump's latest bid to block the Manhattan District Attorney's subpoena of his tax records. Cyrus Vance Jr. is seeking eight years of the president's taxes and other financial records as part of a grand jury investigation looking into payments made to adult film star Stormy Daniels before the 2016 election. The president filed for an emergency appeal almost immediately. A former advisor to President Trump has been charged with fraud. Prosecutors here in New York say Stephen Bannon and three others are being charged in connection with a group called We Build the Wall, which raised funds to build a border wall. Bannon's accused of using that money to pay for his personal expenses. He's due in a New York courtroom today. Iran is responding to stepped-up efforts by the United States to restore sanctions against the country. Iran unveiled new missiles today, including one named after a top general killed in a U.S. drone strike near Baghdad in January. The U.S. will formally propose the snapback of all nuclear-related global sanctions on Iran at the United Nations. But most other countries, even the closest European allies, say because the U.S. left the landmark 2015 nuclear deal, it doesn't have the authority to reinstate the sanctions. Global health officials want to know more about an experimental COVID-19 vac COVID vaccine recently approved in Russia. 
The World Health Organization says it welcomes all advances in vaccine development, but that every vaccine must undergo the same clinical trials. So far, Russia's vaccine has only been tested on a few dozen people. Russia is the first nation in the world to license a coronavirus vaccine. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. The Democratic convention so far has been a show of remarkable unity as progressives like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and moderates and even Republicans like John Kasich and Colin Paul all get together and pledge their support for Joe Biden. But does this unity go beyond a shared desire to see someone other than Donald Trump in the White House? We welcome now Christina Greer, associate professor of political science at Fordham University and author of Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream. So, Professor, thank you so much for being back with us. So answer the question, is this unified for someone, that's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, or is it basically unity against somebody, Donald Trump and Mike Pence? I think it's both and. I mean, David, we're at a moment in our democracy where we are at a, at a crossroads, as John Kasich said. Uh, and many Republicans who have supported Joe Biden recognize that if we go with another four years of a Trump administration, we may lose our democracy altogether. That's something that President Obama spoke about last night. As far as policy positions, I think the devil will be in the details just because of the immense ideological diversity that exists within the Democratic Party. But uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris both being uh, senators at some point in time. Joe Biden was a senator for, you know, close to 40 years and a public servant. And Kamala Harris, obviously, uh, for a much shorter period of time, but both of them knowing in an LBJ sense, uh, Lyndon Johnson, a way to negotiate with the legislative branch whilst trying to push forward policy as the executive branch, I think will be a great asset to them to work with their Republican partners across the aisle. That's what uh, the, the Democratic Convention has shown uh, in so many video montages, the relationships that Joe Biden has had with Republicans over the years, hoping that he'll be able to establish that same type of relationship moving forward if he's chosen to be uh, the executive. So the policy positions are still being laid out, but I do think that uh, this unification against Donald Trump and his administration is real because the threat to the American democracy, as laid out by Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, is incredibly real as well. And, and Christina, as you wisely suggest, if they don't have absolute unanimity on the policies, it may raise questions for governing if they get elected. But before that, they have to get elected. And I guess watching the convention, I have a question, which is, can the Democratic ticket go forward with a very powerful message of equality and racial justice that we've seen over three nights, I'm sure we'll see again tonight, and not leave behind some of the white working class in the United States of America, the so-called Reagan Democrats? Right. Well, I think that we might see some of the um, sort of Biden Republicans uh, just because uh, when you hear the Democrats laying out their vision and sort of what is reality, uh, where they're tapping into this white working class that, you know, each four years we seem to chase uh, is because so many people are out of work. When we think about the 40 million Americans who are currently unemployed, when we think about the over 170 thousand Americans who have died from sheer incompetence and almost cruelty of this administration, that's touching the white working class. That's saying, listen, you have lost possibly a breadwinner. You have lost your job. You may have lost your livelihood because the president has put, uh, he calls it the economy, uh, in front of the American people. But we've seen the corporations who have received money, the trillions of dollars that were that are passing through, uh, and it's not trickling down to a lot of quote unquote regular white people. And so that's some of the messaging that you're hearing from the Democrats, where we know that when people go to the polls, they go oftentimes for pocketbook issues. So they're going to ask themselves, am I better off on November 3rd than I was four years ago on November 8th? And so many Americans are going to say no. They're going to say, no, I don't have a job. No, I no longer have savings. No, I don't have actually a mortgage that I can pay. Uh, I don't have any industries that I can I can work with because they've all gone away because of the coronavirus or the incompetence at the executive level. And so I think that's the fear of this particular administration because the case is pretty clearly laid out uh, and it's just whether or not Americans want to listen uh, to whether or not uh, their circumstances 
have been irrevocably changed. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. It's always a delight to have you. That's Christina Greer, Associate Professor of Political Science at Fordham University. And make sure to catch our special edition of Balance of Power tonight. It will start at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to have the last night of the Democratic National Convention. Coming up here, political and business communication strategist Bradley Tusk on the role of Silicon Valley in the upcoming election. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Bradley Tusk has gone from political strategist and advisor to the man who crafts communications and lobbying campaigns for major Silicon Valley firms like Uber. Among other things, he was a campaign manager for the third mayoral race of Michael R. Bloomberg, founder and majority owner of our parent company. And we welcome now to Bloomberg. So, Bradley, thanks so much for being here. Let's start with technology and the election as we're in the coming into the last night of the Democratic Convention. How will technology change this election, particularly in the world of the pandemic? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Uh, I think it will in a few ways. One is voter turnout, while physically will be a lot lower than usual because people won't want to go to polling places, as we've seen in the last handful of primaries since the pandemic struck, uh, vote by mail is probably going to significantly increase overall turnout. So you have an election where 100 percent of the voters know who Donald Trump is, 100% of the voters know there's an election, um, and about 75% of them will be able to vote if they want to from their home through the mail. So look, assuming it goes smoothly, and there's not a guarantee that it will, and we've clearly seen some issues raised by the Postal Service and by the White House, but there really is an opportunity for the pandemic um, to really significantly increase turnout, and then you get to uh, a, an election that's gonna have uh, a, a very, very, very clear say in it from both sides. I mean, one, one thing that was notable from 2016 was enthusiasm for Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side was very low, and a lack of turnout in states like Michigan or Ohio or Wisconsin is really what led to her defeat there, which has led to her defeat overall. So in the olden times, uh, we would have exit polls and we'd have to go to the polls and then we'd have projections made. And by the by 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, at least by the time the polls closed in California, we'd have projections pretty much. Yeah. Are those days gone as a practical matter? It's a good question. Uh, it's, it's definitely possible right now. We're in a little bit of a transitionary period where because of the pandemic, you're going to have less voting in person and yet newer ideas like mobile voting, which will be able to count the results instantaneously, um, are not quite at scale just yet. And so something like voting by mail becomes the predominant use um, for the 2020 election. So it depends on really how close it is. Um, if either candidate, and right now based on the polling, that means Biden uh, is significantly ahead, the projections still may find that he captured 270 electoral college votes on election day either way. Um, but if the race is really tight and you're looking at counting everything that comes in over the mail and absentee ballots and provisional ballots and everything else, it, it could be days or even weeks. So nature abhors a vacuum. And in my experience, political campaigns abhor not having a decision. We saw it in 2000 when it went on and on and on with the litigation going all the way to the Supreme Court. Does this increase the likelihood we're going to be dragging this out in court battles maybe into January? Yeah, it's certainly possible. And look, in 2000, you had Bill Clinton leaving office either way. So it wasn't like you had someone in the White House that was trying to make sure that they could stay in the White House. In this case, you have an extremely aggressive incumbent in, in Donald Trump who uh, has used litigation throughout his entire career to kind of solve various business problems or deal with them in different ways. And so, yeah, I, I think that unless the results are so overwhelming that there's just no point to it and it actually just does more harm than good, I think we should assume that the president will look to have litigation to try to challenge the, the outcome. So so uh, in general, there's a perception that Silicon Valley tends to lean to the left. I don't know whether that's fair or not. We just saw Palantir, I think, moving their headquarters, at, at least. Palantir being notoriously yeah. somewhat right yeah. of center. Will Silicon Valley overall, on average over time, be an ally of Biden-Harris? Yeah, I, I think so for a, a few reasons. One, culturally, uh, Silicon Valley is very much part of that California progressive mentality. Um, and then economically, one is the Valley really relies on immigration, high-skilled immigration, 
And clearly Trump has had a very different perspective on immigration uh, than what the tech industry would like. So that's number one. Number two, um, I think the Valley, like every business, uh, wants a certain amount of stability. And one thing that they've found in the past four years with Trump is even though the economy at times has done well, uh, although it's struggling much more now, obviously, um, you really just never know what you're going to get every single day. And I think when people are trying to run a business and what they really want is government to just stay out of their way as much as possible, um, having someone in the White House that's far more calm and predictable is likely their preference. Uh, so we have news that's broken even while we've been on the air here at Balance of Power that Lyft will so, 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 uh, so set aside, stop yeah. their operations in California at midnight tonight. Uh, yeah. Is that an issue of a con independent contractor versus employee? Is this a fight with the legislature, essentially? Yeah. So what happened was um, last year, the California legislature said that anyone who works in the sharing economy, so if you're a driver for Lyft or for Uber or a delivery person for Postmates and DoorDash or whatever it is, um, that you are now a full-time employee and not an independent contractor, the sharing economy companies very much oppose that legislation because they say it increases their operating costs by as much as 20%. And so uh, Lyft and Uber and DoorDash and Postmates put about $100 million into an effort called Proposition 22 that'll be on the ballot in California this November to overturn uh, the legislation that passed in Sacramento last year. Um, in the interim, the state of California was able to legally say that Uber could not and, and Lyft could not continue to refuse to classify their drivers as full-time employees uh, while this was still playing out. And in response, Uber and Lyft are saying they're suspending operations. I think mainly to try to get people to vote for their referendum in November. Uh, it would obviously be a gambit that would work a lot better if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic and a quarantine. Um, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, did it really fall? Um, at a time when Uber and Lyft rides are already down 80 plus percent, um, is suspending operations gonna have a material political difference? You know, I would guess that it will not. But Bradley, I wonder if this may be a, an individual skirmish in a much larger war over a longer period of time, and that is basically, I'll use the term gig economy, that we're going to yeah. need to figure out a way to get better benefits to those workers, whether it's from the federal government, whether it's a state government, whether it's by legislating. Uh, it, it, aren't we inevitably, as more and more of the economy goes in that direction, going to have to protect those people somehow? Uh, well, look, absolutely. I mean, part of the problem here is that Right now, we have kind of a binary labor law system, whether you're an employee or you're an independent contractor. And these were laws that were created almost 100 years ago in the 1930s. The world has obviously changed, you know, dramatically since then. And, you know, what made sense then doesn't make, make sense today. And so what I think a lot of people who work in the sharing economy, the gig economy would like, is a little bit of both. They, would, they like the flexibility of being an independent contractor. People are driving for Uber and Lyft and any other platform they can because that maximizes their revenue. But at the same time, they want health care, they want pension mm -hmm. benefits, they want disability, they want workers' comp. So one idea that's been put forth lately is the notion mm -hmm. of a portable benefits plan where the gig economy companies pay into a, a program yeah. that provides benefits for uh, their workers, but they still remain classified as independent contractors and not as full-time employees. That's fascinating. Really appreciate you being with us, Bradley. That's yeah, Tusk Ventures <laughs> founder and CEO, Bradley Tusk. Coming up, polling expert Frank Luntz on where we are in the polls today and whether we should be paying attention to them. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Polls in recent days have been pretty consistent in showing President Trump trailing Vice President Biden, both nationally and in some key battleground states. But polls have been misleading in the past, and we've seen that, and so we have to be take them with a grain of salt. We welcome now Frank Luntz, who has spent a career doing polls, using polls, advising on polls, and including to Newt Gingrich and to Pat Buchanan and to Rudy Giuliani. So, Frank, thank you so much for being here. Give us a little tutorial. How much attention should we be paying right now to these polls that come out almost every day? It's a good question. And they really are only indicative of where the race is going. And I tend to use them as a comparison. Donald Trump was behind by maybe four points. 90 days ago, 
He's now behind by nine or ten points in most surveys. And that tells me that he's slipping, that something is happening, that either Joe Biden is gaining credibility and traction or that Donald Trump is losing it. And so I tend to look at the relative nature, how things change over 30 days. But I'm also trying to figure out who are the likely voters, who's actually going to participate, because that's one of the greatest challenges in survey research. And what we have found in our research is that everyone is going to vote. Everyone is excited about it. And I, I really think that it's too early to make a conclusion about who the likely winner is. But Joe Biden is absolutely in the lead. And for Donald Trump to challenge that, it just shows that he doesn't really understand survey research at this point. So everyone may be enthusiastic and really committed to voting. Uh, what if they can't vote? I mean, we've got some disputes all around the country about things like mail-in voting, whether you can do it, whether you cannot do it. There are questions about when the ballot gets to get in, whether the Postal Service can deliver it. How can you judge, as a pollster, what votes will actually get counted? Well, what I'm absolutely nervous about right now is what happens if we get a result on election night that indicates that one candidate is the winner, but as the postal votes come in, and there are going to be millions and millions and millions of them, then the vote changes. So you've got one winner seemingly declared Tuesday night or early Wednesday morning, and then by Friday or Saturday or the next week, the numbers change. This is exactly what happened to six congressional races in California where Republicans were leading on election night, but they ended up losing their races. So we've seen it already on the local level. What happens to the country if this is what occurs on the national level? And second, we don't know where COVID is going to be on November 3rd. And so people may wait, may assume that they're going to vote uh, uh, in person, and then they may want to cast votes by mail. I'm nervous about the lines at the polling places. It, it, right now, we have a fundamental fear that the democracy that we've known for over 200 years is neither free nor fair, that an increasing percentage of Americans believe that these elections are not necessarily counting every vote, that everyone doesn't get the chance to participate. And David, I got to tell you, uh, if you start to lose faith in the democratic process, then you really do lose faith in America and its future. Uh, Frank, picking up on just that very point, are we seeing some of the shift, uh, I don't remember at least, maybe I wasn't paying attention, where the very legitimacy of the election itself becomes part of the political game. That is to say, we have a president of the United States who's really already questioning the legitimacy of certain ways of voting and saying you can't rely on it, you can't trust it. Uh, is that now becoming a political point? Well, it was a political point in 2000 when we had an election that essentially ended in a tie. And you had about one-fourth of Americans who believe that the other party won that election. And we've never really solved that. We've never addressed it, and it's become deeper and deeper. You have Democrats who believe that Republicans practice voter suppression. You have Republicans who believe that Democrats practice voter corruption. And so we see this increasing rejection of faith in not just the systems of government, but the election, election process itself. And it is frightening because the consequences of this in this country are horrific. A simple rejection of whomever wins in November. Uh, Frank, as I said earlier, all of us have been burned by a poll here or there that's come out entirely uh, different than we thought, and it turned out it wasn't very reliable. Uh, in your experience, because it's a, a substantial and successful experience over many years, is polling more accurate today than it was 20 years ago? Well, let me disabuse uh, viewers and listeners of one thing that happened in 2016. The exit polls had Hillary Clinton winning by 2.9 percent. She actually won the popular vote by 2.1 percent. To be off by 0.8 percent is accurate. That is well within the margin of error, and that is appropriate. Now, they got the states wrong, but they got the national numbers correctly. And we also know that Donald Trump is doing better in the swing states than he is overall in the country by about two percentage points. So are they more accurate? Pollsters pay much more attention now to the samples, to how the polling is drawn. 
but you still have rogue polls, which is what they call them, ones that are just beyond the margin of error. And it's again, it's always meant to be indicative, representative, but don't take them as a sure thing. I know that on Election Day, I'm going to be really careful about how I report on the exit polls, having seen so many state-by-state -state numbers getting it wrong back in 2016. Well, and I was there in 2000 at ABC News when we all got it wrong in, in the Clinton-Gore situation. But, but as a final point here, uh, as a practical matter, you're saying that we may not be able to rely on what we hear on Election Day after the votes have been counted because it won't be all the votes. Exactly. And when you've got postal voting where they are accepting votes that are postmarked on Election right. Day, it can take three or four days for right. the numbers to come in. In right. the House races, it yeah. took more than a week before yeah. we knew who was and the winner. The, and we in the media tend not to be very patient. Thanks so much, Frank. Really a treat to have you. He's Frank Luntz, renowned pollster. And a programming note now, you, we can, you can tune in and watch our special coverage of the Democratic Convention starting at 9 p.m. this night, Eastern Time. This is Bloomberg.